Yo, what up, what up, my friends? Mike Hill, the whole Selling Titan here. And what I want to talk to you about in today's video is how to find motivated seller leads. Specifically, I want to answer the question that I get asked the most often, and that is, Mike, what is the best source of motivated seller leads? Now, uh, to disappoint some of you, the truth is there is not one universally best source of leads. It just doesn't exist. Matter of fact, if it did, everyone would probably attack the exact same lead source and due to competition, um, in all likelihood, it would fail to be a great lead source. So what I want to do here is I'm just going to give you one because I'm sure there's some people that are just like, you know, give me the list. I just need that one list. Um, so I will give you, you know, one of my highest converting lists that you can use. Um, but what I really want to talk to you about is how to figure out what is going to be the best source of motivated seller leads for you personally. So first, let me get this out of the way. Um, one of my highest converting lists is absentee owners uh, who have just evicted a tenant and have equity in the property. Now, if it's not obvious, um, that's a very good list and it converts very well because there are so many levels of motivation that are stacked on top of each other. These guys are absentee owners, oftentimes, especially if they live in another state and they're a frustrated landlord and they have equity, it's just kind of the perfect storm. Um, I do have a video on my YouTube channel, so you can go ahead and watch that to see how I put those lists together and how they perform. But for those of you who are looking for one great list, that's a really, really good one they can use. Uh, but more importantly, and what I really want to dive into here is some tangible things you can take with you to figure out, hey, what really is going to be the best lead source for me? Um, and so I'll show you that in just a second, but I kind of want to start off by prefacing this by saying, um, you know, a lot of time folks are looking for and a lot of the questions I get are just that. What is the best lead source? And what really distinguishes the accomplished wholesaler, you know, you can have two wholesalers use the exact same list and one of them could go off and make six figures, a million dollars, and the other one won't even be able to do one deal. And that should be indicative of the fact that it's not just in the list. Sure, it's important, but much more important than that are habits and routines. And that's something I've really been stressing with my students a lot lately. And then with that, consistency and follow-up is far more important than any one specific list source. It's like if you're going to the gym, what's the best exercise, the best, the best, you know? Yeah, sure, there's some that work better than others depending on your goals, but you know, bear with me for the <laughs> analogy. Um, but the point is, if someone is consistent versus someone who is inconsistent, the actual exercise matters a lot less. It's much more a factor of being consistent. So as we dive more into the video, I just would like you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, on a similar note, you guys probably know I'm a huge MMA fan. Shout out to my team, American Top Team. Uh, but you see things on forums and comments and it's like, what is the best submission in MMA? Um, and then you look at, you know, the white belt and the black belt. And these guys have the same move, the same technique, right? Let's say an arm bar. But what differentiates the two is that the black belt is in there training every day, six, seven days a week, sometimes two, three sessions a day doing the same move over and over and over and drilling and drilling and drilling and then rolling and doing it live. Whereas the amateur, you know, wants to learn, know all the knowledge about it and, you know, hear you talk about it and hear the breakdown and then maybe they train, you know, um, you know, once uh, once a week, or these are the guys you see, they practice it five times because the instructor says five times, and then they sit and they wait, they're done. Um, so again, back, just back to the consistency. I know it's a little bit repetitive, but I really cannot stress this enough. All right, um, so now if you're taking notes, it's probably the good time uh, where I'm going to get it. It's some more tangible things, a little bit more actionable, and I will provide you guys with a couple of examples here in just a moment. Uh, but the first thing I really want to stress is that you need to establish a target market. Um, I talk about this stuff a lot. There are two videos on my YouTube channel that, uh, again, if you're taking notes, I suggest you go back and watch those first. Now, this is not something that needs to take you days, weeks, or months. Literally, this can be done in one day. And the time that you spend to do this will save you months, uh, literally months of, uh, you know, kind of spinning your wheels, wasted time, maybe marketing dollars that 
um, are spent in vain and just, you know, a lot of trial and error that you don't need to do. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time stressing it here. Go back and watch those videos. You want to really get a feel for your market. You want to make sure you're somewhere where there is demand. You want to know where, you know, look at the kind of a heat map. I show you how to do that in the video as well, where you see where are most buyers concentrated? What are the cash purchases? And, and also in addition to knowing that there is demand, you want to know um, what prices that demand is. You know, that maximum allowable offer, you know, 65% or 70% times ARV and then minus your repairs and your profit. It's a great general rule outline, but man, that thing is not law. I am in a very, very competitive, a highly competitive market. There's a lot of demand from buyers and um, there's a lot of competition for inventory too. But because I have that feel on my market, I know what the prices that are selling. And so oftentimes I'm able to sell wholesale deals at even 80% of ARV just because I know that information. So the first thing I really want to stress to you is put in that initial work. Um, if you guys have read my ebook, 41 Ways to Find Motivated Sellers, fast as hell. Um, if you haven't downloaded it, I'll put a link in the um, description here. Um, but I really make that idea about going deep and narrow as really being one of the keys as opposed to going shallow and wide. I see that happening a lot. And I use the analogy, if you were digging for gold and you dug you know, five feet deep across every single inch of the United States, across the world, you would be very busy, you'd be working very, very hard, you'd spend a lot of time and money, but you would never get results. And that's what I see a lot of people doing. They're just spreading so thin. Whereas if you do the proper research, back to the gold analogy, you know, you find out where other prospectors found gold, you talk to a, a geologist or you know, whoever it is that knows that stuff, and you look at where other people have been successful mining, and you take all that data, and then you say, okay, I have a pretty good idea that somewhere in this, you know, however you, you map out your radius based on, um, you know, your, your budget or whatever you're working with, you say, I'm going to just go deep here in this area where it's most likely to be. That's where you're going to be successful. So that's why the target market stuff is so important. And I see so many people just, you know, kind of brush over that. So, uh, again, not too much there. Go back and watch those videos. And then we'll jump into the rest here. Um, so what I want to advise that you do is take what I call internal and external inventory. So let me explain. Internal inventory is where you take a good, hard, deep look at yourself in a very realistic way. And you say, what are my resources? What are your strengths? That means um, how much time do you have available to commit to this? And I don't mean like you work when you feel like it, you work when you have um, some time available. No, what can you realistically commit to this business every single day? So when I have mentoring students come into my program, one of the things that I have them do first is make a schedule. Now, I've been in a lot of masterminds and business courses and I've... Um, you know, even seeing, you know, people doing their wholesaling and what they do is they kind of take the tasks they want to do and they map those out first. What I do is I do a little bit backwards. I have my students do is take their schedule and drop in all of the things that don't change, the things that they need to do on a daily basis that do not relate to wholesaling. So that includes, you know, dropping the kids off at school, picking the kids up from school, any extracurriculars, going to the gym, um, working a nine to five, whatever it is, you fill that in first because those are the things you know that you're going to be doing and you can over over often overlook them if you don't put them on paper and then what that will do is that will kind of show you the blocks that you really have available you know those times that are not dedicated to anything else and then from there when you have that visibility that's when you lock it in and you say yo this is wholesaling time um if you guys are religious maybe you attend church or something on a regular basis you know that every sunday at 9 or 11 o'clock or whatever it is, you are going to be in church, right? Same thing. Every day at um, 5 p.m., I'm going to make calls for an hour. It doesn't matter. Whatever time you have, it's what you have. It's like a workout analogy I like to use. Who's going to, let's say someone wants to lose weight. Who's going to lose more weight? The person who says, you know, when I feel like it, I'm going to go to the gym. And when I do or when I have the time, right, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to work out for four hours in a row and you know, I'm going to lose the weight. It doesn't work. Um, similarly, you have people you know, who come, they get very excited about the business. They say, man, I'm going to make a thousand offers. I'm going to go hard. And same thing. They're not consistent. They put in a lot of work. 
they get burnt out, they get overwhelmed, this is too much, and then surprise, surprise, this doesn't work, and then they don't do it. Whereas, imagine the person who has very limited time, but they say, you know what, I want to lose this weight, I'm in it for the long haul, I only have 20 minutes available every day, but every fucking day I'm going to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and I'm going to go for a 20-minute run 7 days a week, you know, 365, whatever. That person will see results, even if it's not the best workout, um, even if they don't have the most time available, that person will see the results. So the first thing you got to say is, how much time can I realistically commit to it? Because that's going to impact um, what type of lead strategies you choose, and it's also going to help you prioritize. So you're not trying to do like 50 different things at once. What's the most important um, wholesaling task that you can do? The next thing you need to do is take a look at, what's my money situation? Um, you know, if you don't have money, that's okay. You can do deals, but there's certain deals that you probably shouldn't pursue. Even if you might have a chance, I'm not going to say anything's impossible, but you want to maximize your chances. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, if you have no money, there are certain strategies that you should really stick to. I'll talk about those in just a second. And then if you do have a certain amount of money, you kind of need to figure that out. So I've got a couple of videos where I say one of the first things I recommend is that you know you try to cut down your regular expenses so that way you have about $200 uh, per month that you can commit to a CRM. I find that very helpful. You guys have seen me use mine. It's one of the first things I recommend in terms of paid um uh, resources that you should use. Um, if you want to do direct mail, you can't just say, well, I got enough to mail one month. I'm just going to throw these things out there and see what happens. I mean, you could, you might get lucky, but I'm just saying, if you want to make sure this is consistent, you don't want to be the person who says, maybe I'll do a deal. Maybe I won't. You know, you want to say, um, I have, I can make replicatable results where every month I know I'm going to do a deal. And so if you're doing things, if you're doing it that way, then you need to calculate and say, okay, I'm going to mail to this list. But I know that in order to make this work, I need to mail to the same list for a minimum of six months. So if you're on a limited budget, what that means is that when you get a list, say from list source or wherever you might pull your list from, I talk about some different sources, but that maybe you want to spend extra time, you know, if you have more time than money, and go through and copy and paste is what I used to do. It was very time consuming. Um, but you know, I had to do that and copy each address and paste it to Zillow and say, okay, is this worth mailing out, you know, or is it a mobile home or is it a condo? Um, and maybe you should just take them off the list so you don't waste that money because it's limited. On the flip side, the inverse, if you don't have the time, you have a little bit more money, just mail to everyone because your time is very valuable. And then you have to do that math and say, okay, I'm going to mail 250 pieces or a thousand pieces or 5,000 pieces. Um, and I need to make sure I have that budget in place for at least a minimum of six months. So you really have to do that math. Are there any other resources that you have? Do you have a child maybe who can stuff and stamp letters for you so you don't have to pay as much for a mail house? Ask me how I know about that. Um, but these are just some examples. You really have to look at yourself and what you can realistically commit to on a daily, on a monthly basis. And then we're going to talk about how you match that up to your strategy. So the next thing, if you can tell, is going to be your external inventory. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of what I mean by that, but essentially that's what's available to you as a resource in your target market that you can easily get either easily, consistently, or perhaps even carve some type of competitive niche out of. So we're going to start from scratch here, right? And I'm going to show you another lead source of mine. It is probate. Um, I actually sold a probate property yesterday and I have another one that's, um, at the title company, you know, ready to go. The buyer signed, they got their earnest money deposit up and everything, but we're just waiting for it to clear probate. And I don't even have a timeline because that's just how probate works. So waiting on that, but as soon as it clears probate, that will be a done deal. But let me show you why I chose probate and why I cannot say to you that probate is the best list for you, but why it's a great list for me. So as you guys know, I live here in Palm Beach County. This is something, if I'm honest, I, I haven't shared before on the YouTube channel publicly because I think people are going to use it. But hey, if you steal this from me, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't believe in that. No scarcity here. But if you do use this lead source and you have your own buyers, by all means, fucking kill it. Uh, but if you don't, yo, I got a lot of buyers here in Palm Beach County. So hit me up. Let me know. Let's do some joint venture stuff. All right. So I'm just going to actually put it all out there, right? So we're going to look at Palm Beach County clerk, right? 
So here we go. It's the courthouse. And now when I first got to Florida, I didn't know about this, man. I used to go down to the um, court and then, you know, survey my external resources. Guess what I found? These probate records are available online very easily and very inexpensively. So here we're going to records, court records, and then we're going to find the uh, oops, clerk card. And then we're going to categories and probate. All right, so you can see they release these things. We've got the weekly report. I'm just going to click here. We'll do the monthly report. Um, I'm going to show you how quick this is. So the price is $5.60. Um, you know, some people are spending hundreds of dollars on lists, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I'm just saying, $5. So let me buy this right here for you in real time. I'll log into my account real quick. Okay, so here we are, literally, you guys watch this, within two minutes and five dollars, I now have all of the probate records. Now if we look here, we've got a case number, uh, we have um, decedent first name, last name, the address, and then if we go over here, personal representative, that's the person that you're going to want to be contacting, um, and then we also have the attorney's information, and as you can see, there are literally hundreds of, um, of records here on this list. And so for me, when we talk about external inventory, this is just such an easy way to go. Now, conversely, let's go see what Broward has for us, right? So Broward is another area I do deals, but I'm going to demonstrate why, oops, county clerk, why this might not be a great option. Okay, so uh, this is actually a little bit annoying, but let me kind of explain to you. So they've done some changes here. So now the reports and forms are actually, which I didn't realize uh, before purchasing this, compressed in a file with EXE extension. So already that's problematic. I don't have a Windows computer to open this up for you guys. Um, so I can't show you what it looks like. Um, it wasn't like this in the past. You could actually just download it in CSV format. But the point I wanted to make is that the information in the online listing is pretty much useless. They don't give you all of the information, um, you know, the representative and attorney and all that stuff. It just basically shows you case numbers. Um, there is an option here, report layout, where they show you a sample. So let's just take a look here. Let me download this. Um, yeah, and essentially, this is the type of information you're going to get. It, it's kind of gibberish, right? So that's not to say that probates aren't good in Broward County, but again, if you want to make this replicatable, maybe make it fit your lifestyle, fit you know your budget, maybe fit your time available, maybe you don't want to be going to the courthouse, then this might not be the best option for you. Similarly, I had, um, I had someone contact me via email, and they said, Mike, you know, I can't get, um, I can't find this stuff on the um, online. So I explained to her, hey, you might just have to go down to the courthouse. And we talked a little bit. Well, I don't know where to go or look. It's like, dude, I wouldn't know where to go. Just go. There's going to be someone at the desk. Ask them, where can I get the records? Right. And so she went and she found out, hey, you know, they have it, but they don't have it online, only at the courthouse. I said, look, back to in internal inventory, right? You got to say to yourself, well, if they don't have it online, it could be good and bad. Number one, it means that there's probably less competition. As easy as you guys saw me get the Palm Beach records, which I'm sure maybe some of you will be doing now, um, a lot of competition because it's just so easy. Um, so that's the good part. You know, you can get it very easily, but the bad part might be a lot of competition. For her, I said, you know, you might be able to carve a great competitive niche if you're willing to go ahead and do that on a regular basis, right? So if you're willing to go down and do the work, sure, that could be even that could be great for you. And again, it might be something where a lot of people are not doing it. But will you do it consistently? Will you be at the courthouse every Friday and getting those records on a regular basis? And that's what you need to really be asking yourself. Part of it is what can you, are you willing to do and can you commit to do, not just want to do, but what can you actually commit to do? So we can go ahead and check out, let's check out one more. Let's look at Dade County, all right? So that's Miami, if you're not familiar. So Dade County Clerk. All right, so again, here we are. Now they have a search, but if you look, 
you have to have the party name or the case type here and so you have to be searching for a specific case so there isn't a situation where you can just go ahead and download that entire list so again if you're looking for ease or you maybe want to do this virtually like for example if you wanted to do the Palm Beach stuff, you could do that virtually. You could be in freaking Oklahoma, log on, buy the probate list, send the mail, talk to people on the phone, put it under contract, and then find some wholesaler with buyers uh, in Palm Beach County and say, hey, man, I got a deal. You got buyers? For, for example. Uh, but I'm just saying, if you want to do something like this virtually, it's going to be a lot more difficult for you to do it, you know what I'm saying, if you're not here at the, at the clerk um, I'm sorry, where you're able to go to the courthouse. So let me give you guys another example. Um, I did a video, one of my first videos was about finding um, leads through code violations, right? So we looked at, in that video, I looked at Hollywood, Florida, code violations, right? And I showed you guys this, but just as a quick refresher, great website, really cool. We can do code violation search. Look at open cases, and here, look at all the different violations they have. All right. Um, so, for example, high grass, eight over eight inches, right? Probably vacant. Search, bam, you have it right there. The street address is there. A little hint: they also have this in um, Miami-Dade County, and they tell you the specific violations. Now, yeah. On the flip side, let's go ahead and check out Lake Worth. Uh, code violations, right? So Lake Worth code Alright, so code compliance Alright, kill me man. Alright, the point is um, obviously I've been here before and um, similar situation, I believe you can look just by uh, last name or maybe case number or something like that. But there isn't an option where you could search for a list of violations. So again, if you're in you know, Hollywood, that would be a great resource for you. But here, not so much. I got to tell you, that video I made was one of the first videos on my YouTube channel. And to this day, probably at least, I'd say maybe once a week, somebody hits me with an email or a DM or something. It's like, Mike, I can't find the code violations online. Uh, in my city and it's like bro do you, you want me to go hit up your city hall and be like yo my homeboy wholesaler needs you to put this information online man I say like, dude if they don't have it you know they don't have it so what you need to do is either branch out look at you know neighboring cities maybe consider um, some additional markets that you want to research for example Hollywood's here the bordering towns Pembroke Pines Miramar they don't have that type of information available so you might have to just look and do a little bit of searching to find out also get creative there's some municipalities where you can find all of the houses that have fire damage is that gonna be a great source for you sure in other places not so much I got a buddy of mine um, he's out in California his niche is he's able to find, um, what is it, all houses that have had the water turned off for, you know, however long it is, for like three months. And he uses that to target for his direct mail. I don't know if he has a personal contact or if it's available online, how he's doing it. But just as an example, that's an amazing resource that you can use and capitalize on. So sometimes it's just a matter of thinking outside the box. Now, I have a student who's doing very well up in Baltimore. Her go-to is vacant houses. Now, I don't know if this is the same site she uses, but I did a five-minute Google search and came up with this website. You type in vacant Baltimore, I think, and it comes up with this website. Check this out. It has all the addresses here, and we can see showing rows of 16,762 properties. So sometimes it's just a matter of not saying, well, what is the best, you know, I need, I need the best list. It is saying, um, you know, again, what uh, external things are there that I could find? And a lot of times it just takes a little bit of creativity and Google search. And yes, there are certain proven methods, but I'm just saying, you know, you do have to consider these things and then kind of figure out how to match it up. Um, likewise, this is another example. I remember when, when talking about the internal inventory, you know, I've had people hit me up and they say, um, you know, Mike, I have no money. I don't even have enough for an earnest money deposit. But I found this really great property and, um, you know, it's $800,000 or I've had other people say, you know, it's a 20 unit apartment building. How can I flip it or get it under contract? And, you know, again, I never want to say anything's impossible. It's not really my style. But 
you do want to maximize your chances. So my whole thing is like, it sounds kind of messed up. It's like kind of stay in your lane. Um, and that's not to discourage you, but it's just to increase the conversion so you can build up that capital. So I would say, hey, instead of focusing on those properties, is there a neighborhood maybe close by where the houses maybe go for less, maybe in the $100,000 range, which number one is typically opens up a larger buying pool simply because more people have $100,000 and $800,000 in cash. Um, but um, yeah, maybe you want to focus on those where you can get away with smaller earnest money deposits, $500, $1,000, something like that, and then build some capital where maybe you could put up a earnest money deposit of ten grand or whatever when you want to build... Um, you know, bid on, on some higher stuff or something like that. Um, also, just on a note of taking that internal inventory, I, I said I was going to mention this before and I, I kind of forgot. Um, but if you are starting with no money, um, number one, I have a video that I made not too long ago, how to wholesale with zero to $1,000. I would definitely watch that. But it means, um, again, don't try to go for some of the, you know, jump the gun. It's not saying that it's impossible, but you really want to maximize what's going to bring you the fastest return. So maybe you don't want to go for those, you know, those types of properties. And so what I would recommend if you're working with very little or no money, again, watch that video, but this is just a quick recap. Number one, go after distressed houses on the MLS. You know, as wholesalers, we're looking for the motivated sellers. They're motivated by circumstance. That's typically either going to come from networking or paid marketing. But distressed houses on the MLS, man, watch that video. I'll show you how to set up, uh, you know, auto searches and using Zillow where you can get notifications anytime anything that matches that type of criteria comes onto the MLS. And if you're telling me you don't have MLS access, again, Zillow, it's great, man. It, it pulls from multiple MLSs, so it's not just local. Um, and bid on those properties. You can also do um, JV deals with other wholesalers. Call them, talk to them, and then be of value, be of service. Post those deals on sites like Craigslist, My House Deals, BiggerPockets.com. That's how I did my very first wholesale deal, and I did not have to put a penny into it. Do a lot of networking. Talk to people. Talk to every single person you possibly can. Um, tell them what you do. Let them know what you do, and um, you know, ask. You really got to ask. Um, what else? In addition to the networking in one second i think i have some notes here oh cold calling cold call all the for sale by owners and the thing is you gotta not look at this stuff in a vacuum like okay i did this and it didn't work there's sometimes you take action and then you might not see the results for several months so for example when i was telling you to post other wholesalers deals people are going to call you so even if you don't sell that other wholesalers deals you speak to the buyer, you get their information, you start building your list, and then maybe when you get your first deal, maybe a month, maybe two months from now, whatever it is, you now have some people to bring it back to you. So that effort, that work is not in vain. Similarly, when you cold call, you know, you don't want your first cold call to be maybe the property that you want, right? So look at it as practice. You're going to use this to develop a skill set of getting very good and comfortable speaking to people, talking to people on the phone, um, negotiating with tougher sellers, dealing with maybe listing agents who maybe want to grill you and try to verify that you kind of know what the hell you're doing, right? And so that's really going to help you, um, www.wholesalingscripts, by the way, uh, if you want to check out so wholesalingscripts.com, if you want to check out my scripts, um, that'll help you out a great deal. But again, just get comfortable. You got to get comfortable taking the action. Um, so again, a lot of cold calling will definitely help you out there. But I would really, really stay focused on that um, and especially doing a lot of the distressed inventory on the MLS. Um, again, guys, one thing I really just want to stress is that you know, there are a lot of list services out there. There's softwares. There's all kind. Every time, every time I look, there's something new, right? And there are a lot of really good softwares and really good, um, I don't know, just newer kind of things that will that are great supplements. You know, so again, back to our gym analogy. If you're wanting to get in shape, and especially for the first time, right? You spend all your time. What's the best creatine? And what's the best pre-workout? And you just take the supplements, it's not gonna, you're not gonna get any change. You have to have the foundation first of saying, hey, when can I really go to the gym? What's gonna be my gym time that is sacred? Doesn't change. Every day I'm gonna be in the gym, and then my nutrition's gotta be on point. And then when that stuff is solid, right, that's when you can take the supplements, and then they'll just boost you and really, really um, 
you know, help you out there. So I hope that kind of helps and gives you just kind of, um, you know, an idea of, of what we're doing here. And I really just want to kind of con um, stress the consistency aspect here. Again, so often it's not about having the best thing, the best diet. I talk about this again in that ebook, 41 Ways to Find Motivated Sellers Fast as Hell. Um, you know, a lot of people, and back to these analogies again, it's like the diet, they got to have the best diet. So they do Atkins for a week and it doesn't work. And then you go South Beach for a week. And it doesn't work. They go to keto for a week. It doesn't work in intermittent fasting. And by all these changes and being all over the place, that's why they don't see progress. Whereas if they just said, hey, I don't know if this is the best, but you know what? I'm just going to pick one and do it consistently for eight weeks. And after eight weeks, I'll reevaluate. But until that point, I'm going to kind of um, suspend looking at the results just temporarily so I commit to the process and make it a habit, make it a routine where it happens almost unconsciously every day, the same way maybe you get up in the morning and you automatically have to take a piss or something like that. It's like, that's how your offer making, that's how your follow-up should be. Now, I really want to stress to you that, yes, lead source is important and there's stuff like that. And matter of fact, again, if you look in that book, it'll help you kind of match up, um, you know, if your internal inventory is here and your external here, your budget, you know, this is kind of what you want to focus on. Um, you know, in that same sense, that's kind of where you want, um, I'm losing my train of thought here, but um, where you want to implement your routines and kind of realizing that it is the consistency there that's really going to be more important to you than the actual lead source. Uh, but at the same time, hopefully I gave you a couple of things that you can um, use if you do want to pursue those lead sources. Don't forget about your boy, like I said, if you got something down here in Florida. Uh, but either way, I hope that really helps. And if you guys have questions or comments, as always, please do leave them in the comment section. I try to respond to as many of those as I can. And if you have not subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. It does help the channel out a great deal, and I appreciate it. Love it very much. And don't forget to hit the bell notification. Otherwise, you won't get notified when I have new videos. So uh, one more glance at some notes. But Pretty sure that's all I got for you guys. So until the next video, thank you guys so much, and I will talk to you soon. Peace. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, there is one last thing. I said I'd put the link in the description, but I know not everyone looks at the description. So I want to let you know that ebook, 41 Ways to Find Motivated Sellers Fast as Hell. Um, you can download it for free at my website, which is www.needmotivatedsellers.com. So again, there are 41 of the best ways. Um, to find motivated sellers leads and cheap distressed houses to flip. I've got strategies, techniques, tips, tricks, and an actual resources, sources, websites, and stuff like that. Uh, again, it does include free and paid strategies, so you can kind of figure out, you know, do that matchmaking that we talked about to figure out um, your internal and external inventory and which lead strategies would be appropriate for you, you know, as well as some implementation steps to actually making that stuff work. So again, check out needmotivatedsellers.com and I'll see you guys on the next video.